changing those uh, unjust realities. Thank you so much, um, Abeba. And I think that's a lot of the data justice work is trying to look at you know, acknowledging these deep structural inequalities that are perpetuated with, um, you know, with advancing digital um, technologies being overlaid over these inequalities. Um, you know, can anything be done? Um, or are we actually just you know, confronted by such, such deep cleavages? Uh, Jenny, um, I'm hoping that you could speak to us a little bit about data, what you understand by data justice in your um, connected by data work, but you're also the uh, co-lead of the uh, data governance working group of the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence that has also just produced some um, policy briefs and, and, and papers um, together with IT for Change and RIA on, um, on, on, on data justice. But broadly and also from connected, specifically by connected of data, by data where you're looking at collective decision making. Please let us, let us hear what you think about uh, where we stand with data justice at the moment. Uh, thank, thanks, Alison, and, and thanks uh, for everybody for uh, letting me join today. Um, uh, yeah, so I suppose I come from having a background in open data. So the idea that, uh, you know, access to data is a, is a great way of breaking down the exclusive power of big data holders, whether that's um, government or, or big tech or even like large NGOs, um, that open data can bring us, you know, greater accountability. We can see what organizations are up to. Um, we can uh, see what they see and see the world in the way that they see it. Um, that, it that open data provides us with more uh, or easier collaborative work and like work around humanitarian open street map, for example, uh, and that open data can bring more economic opportunity. So, so things like small businesses being able to get hold of this data that is otherwise held in silos by these, these um, uh, big data holders and, and power holders. Um, but over like a stretch of time, the, the uh, dozen years or so that I've been working, uh, starting in open data, it's just really become apparent that simply providing more access to data doesn't create just outcomes at all. Um, so, and I think there are two fundamental things around that for me. One is that um, even when you're making data open to everyone, people have different capabilities to exploit that data, different know-how, different access to, uh, to connectivity, to compute, to, to electricity, different kinds of access to ideas, to funding, to networks, different kinds of cultural capital. So often that openness of, of data disproportionately benefits those who are already ahead of the game. Um, and the second thing is that all of this data that we're talking about is about people and it's about communities and it's used to affect people and communities. And so um, there are issues around representation, both over-representation and over-surveillance and under-representation. So people being unseen and therefore unsupported and not factored into the way that data gets used. We've got all of these issues of data extractivism, so, so data being collected about communities that don't then have power to use it. And instead, like that data gets collected, done something with, and then those communities are acted upon rather than having power within that relationship. We have all these issues around data colonialism, so where the, the structures and the very way in which data makes us think about the world is, is based not on the way that communities think about themselves, but about the way that colonizers think about them. Um, and we have these broader and differential impacts on communities. So who benefits most from these new amazing uses of data and technology? It's not just about, you know, out and out harms. It's also about distributional kind of benefits as well. So all of those issues, like while I was at the Open Data Institute, I was really, uh, really wrestling with and um, and really became very salient to, to me. You know, when I first started on my open data journey, it was a lot about knowledge is power and having more knowledge is a, is a great thing. But the power needs to rest with the people that the knowledge is about. Those communities need to have power in order to get knowledge in order to help themselves. And so that's why I've been uh, so uh, that's why I've moved to working uh, at Connected by Data to really focus on this issue of collective and participatory data governance to try and push um, for 
a greater, you know, in, in both practice and in policy, but also in just the way that we talk about data to recognize it as a collective, uh, as something that has collective impacts and as something where the communities who are affected by it need to have power and need to be able to to um, control how it is collected and used and shared. Um, and also that led into the work that, that uh, you know, it was one of the reasons I was particularly supportive of the work that Alison, really you led at, at the Global Partnership on AI around data justice and around um, trying to make those, uh, like that recognition of, of power in the, in the way in which data works and the way in which AI works and the impacts that it has on our societies, to recognise that and to take it into account during the development of AI, which is um, maybe some more of what we'll, we'll get onto as we talk in the rest of the session. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. And perhaps if we can just go straight into Anita. Um, Anita, first, before we go into some further discussion on your particular different works, um, just tell us what you broadly understand by data justice and maybe where those data justice um, debates are at the moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, yes. And I'm just going to build um, on what Jenny said, actually, and uh, also take on the approach that uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, tried to adopt uh, with respect to data justice being connected to AI justice. And uh, I think that this is about reclaiming the knowledge commons of social data for furthering individual and collective sovereignty. We can't forget the individual and we can't forget the larger societal context. And herein lies the right to self-determination, economic and political self-determination, and the right of all peoples to pursue autonomous pathways uh, to development, um, which also is uh, one of the crucial um, uh, cornerstones of the World Summit on the Information Society and its mandate for the UNIGF in this larger context of the intelligence economy, right? Now, I just want to put in a rider here, and that is uh, because um, we don't really have a normative consensus at the international level on what to do about data governance. So, it, it almost seems like uh, the cart before the horse when we talk about data justice, almost as if, you know, we are talking about um, a benchmark like the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, etc. But we really don't have that. And that creates certain problems because data justice is not possible under the current de facto mechanisms uh, in which international economic law works. And what do I mean by this? Primarily two things. One is uh, the IP regime. So we do need to think through how to price open um, also in the tradition of, uh, you know, the contributions that Jenny made, you know, with respect to open data, et cetera, on how intelligence enclosures that occur on account of data enclosures in transnational platform businesses, how could we actually open them up and what should we be doing to overturn current IP regimes to arrive at something that is not anachronistic to the data economy? So um, from you know, the extreme right wing to the extreme left, people are quite agreed on the need to contain this kind of first mover uh, you know, uh, behemoth power. But um, this uh, control in perpetuity of data is something that is uh, really a non-starter if we want to democratize data value. The second, in terms of uh, the conditions uh, that really complicate data justice and we need to transform this is really the way by which in the absence of data governance mechanisms, we often see data related regulation uh, go through regulatory frameworks for trade and e-commerce. And that also entrenches the uh, current dominant power, particularly of two countries, the United States and China. And it takes away the power of uh, many countries. And ideas of allowing data to flow with trust complicate things because we are not just limiting um, justice to the idea of, okay, let there be economic injustice, if only there can be civic justice for privacy. And, uh, you know, this kind of false binary uh, is really not what we want. And therefore, multilateral norms, processes, and normative consensus is very important. If I might just take two more minutes, because uh, I just want to uh, place this in the context of the much-awaited Global Digital Compact, 
uh, we also seem to have a, a call uh, to really preserve the common heritage of mankind and the form of the digital commons. But this kind of ignores two aspects, that data justice, as I said, is enclosed under IP, and there's just going to be a scramble, and all data sets do not belong to all peoples. So the idea of the commons has to be carefully engineered, I think, even while talking about governance and regulations, so that the benefits that Jenny spoke about are very, very clearly embedded in any regulatory or governance uh, framework. And I think the claims of the relevant data publics in terms of three things, I would talk about um, uh, egalitarianism, I would talk about, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, the idea of recognition and to avoid misrecognition that our first speaker spoke about in AI, contextualized decision making in the form of federalism, you know, understanding that data and decisions about data should be closest to people. And of course, the idea of economic rights and distributive justice. I think these are really important. And this is what is the focus, I think, of collective rights, which in proprietarian frameworks of the EU, which are by and large individualist, really don't obtain. And I think just separating uh, things for the purposes of paperwork in terms of the binaries of personal versus non-personal, you know, simply is sidestepping the, the elephant in the room, which is that there is an inalienability of data in terms of individual sovereignty, and we need a solution that can actually be much more comprehensive. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much, Anita, and that's a, a very nice segue to our next round of questions, but I just did want to emphasize that this um, was proposed as a round table, and we are all meant to be involved in this discussion around the table. So if anybody would like to um, make a point on, or raise a question or comment in relation to those first inputs, please do go ahead. Um, Kito, do we have any comments online? Great. Okay. Well, I, th I think we've got a very nice background there for um, uh, our discussion. And in fact, we've already got into some of the practical ways that we have to address this. Um, Anita's already got into some of the, the governance issues that we'll have to tackle and um, the inadequacy of the current kind of um, binaries, these divisions that we've spoken about, and the um, outcomes of some of these uh, more individualized, uh, non-collective, uh, non-economically uh, or materially informed um, governance and, and, and um, frameworks that we've got in place. But just to return to, um, to Abeba, Abeba, your work with these um, big giant data sets that you're ordering, can there be just, just outcomes? I mean, if, you know, if we're not talking about a really kind of manageable data set that you can deal with the biases and that. With these big giant um, databases that are influencing you know, millions of decisions every day and impacting on, on people's lives. Um, can, they, can we actually make, can they be just? Can there be just outcomes? Um, yes and no, uh, but first let's, uh, let's go back and uh, look at what large scale data sets mean and, and, and their critical importance. So um, if you think of AI, uh, it's only over the last 14, 15 years that, ha uh, that it has come to dominate the world. Uh, it, for example, 2008 marks uh, the, what they call the deep learning revolution with the rise of uh, uh, Imaginate, which is uh, a large scale uh, open sourced data set. So, uh, you know, the, the techniques and the methods for AI has been around since the 1960s, the 1970s. So what really made a critical point uh, for AI to be really everywhere is just the availability, I say this with a quotation mark, with the availability of large scale data sets. And that availability came with, with the internet uh, because you need millions and billions of uh, data to, to train AI systems. And the only place you could find that, that kind of data uh, is the internet. So, uh, so it's data sets are really critical. They are the backbone of AI systems. You need huge volumes of data sets uh, to, to, to train and validate AI systems. So 
with that in mind, uh, with uh, ha yeah, having having understood the, the importance of data sets for AI systems, uh, data sets, I, I work with vision data sets. Data sets usually are marked with various problems. For example, uh, because much of the data set comes from the internet, uh, which, is, which uh, you know, pop pe people, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, whether it's, it's text we write on the web, whether it's like the selfies we take and upload on, on, on the web, uh, it's those uh, 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 content that become data sets. So they do, to, to a large extent, reflect um, the status quo or, or stereotypes rather than, uh, rather than representing any underlying reality. So data sets by nature tend to be uh, tend to uh, hold, uh, you know, negative stereotypes to uh, minoritized communities. Data sets also tend to have, to contain content that shouldn't be there. Uh, and a lot of audit work has demonstrated that uh, you find, for example, for image data sets, you find, uh, you know, content that shouldn't be there, for example, you know, images of children. Uh, in my own work, we've also found, you know, images of, uh, images of rape, lots of pornographic images, on, especially on image data sets. Uh, also, another uh, problem, at, problem with data sets uh, is 99% uh, of the time there is no consent. People are not asked if it's okay to, to, to use their, their, their images or, or their, their text uh, uh, to data sets. So, uh, these are some of like uh, the, the, the issues uh, that tend to be uh, anti-equity anti uh, and uh, harmful rather than helpful. Helpful. So, with with this context in mind, again about data sets, uh, you know, a lot of um, whatever system we build based on this based on these data sets again tends to be tends to to reflect you know the the stereotypes that are held in data sets the labeling space uh, that is discriminatory or biased in in data sets so the models often reflect this and the outputs often reflect this so generally uh, data sets are are not very just by nature uh, they are actually unjust by default we really have to it's better to assume data sets are harmful and unjust by nature and then work from there to make them better um, or to detoxify them or whatever method we can come up with. So having outlined the various negative issues uh, that show that uh, large scale data sets tend to be unjust for uh, especially communities at the margins of society, uh, it's also possible to, to have a just I don't want to be a pessimist. I, I, there are also, uh, uh, data sets can also be just. And another major issue uh, that prevents data sets from being just is often uh, take a look at big corporations or big research institutions that, uh, uh, that, uh, that collect and curate these large scale data sets. Their objectives really is not, uh, you know, how do we advance justice? It really is how do we build the bigger, better, you know, models with uh, more parameters. <laughs> so th those objectives uh, are one of the big obstacles as to why data sets tend to, uh, to be uh, not just. Uh, so again, having said that, uh, there are various examples where a just data sets are, uh, is possible. So my go-to example is the Maori community. Uh, they, um, they, for example, are uh, building various uh, language technologies, speech technologies, uh, and uh, as the previous speaker said, for data, for data justice to, uh, to be realized, uh, the people that these systems are supposed to uh, that these systems are supposed to be helping have to have to be in control of those, the, both the data sets and the systems and the Maori community, what the Maori community is doing exactly that. So from, from at, at every step of the pipeline of that language technology that they are building, they really are in control. For example, 
in, in one of the projects, they collected voice data, over 300 um, hours of voice data. They uh, labeled, annotated, cleaned the data set themselves. Uh, they built the technology themselves, for themselves. Uh, and they have, uh, I think, uh, uh, the, the Maori principle, I can't remember the exact full name, where uh, they have uh, some kind of uh, governance and policy uh, regulatory outlines that makes sure that that puts them in, in complete control about uh, uh, about access to data they have their own data uh, infrastructure where you know they know where exactly where the, the data set is going so from from you know uh, from all the way from data sets to to take building to uh, you know, control of infrastructure, they really have the autonomy. So I guess this is, uh, for me, an example that it's possible to have uh, uh, just or equitable data sets, but uh, that requires a lot of work, and this kind of work is not without challenges. They have faced so many challenges throughout the project. For example, uh, driven by the, this idea of open sourcing, you know, the momentum for open sourcing, uh, they had so much pushback from big corporations uh, to open up their data and yeah, they, uh, they had to fight, uh, you know, the, they had to uh, work hard to, to make sure that they, the data set remains in, in their own control. Uh, yeah, so in just to summarize, yes, uh, large scale data sets tend to be anti-equitable and extreme, extremely harmful and they just exacerbate stereotypes. Uh, but also it's possible to have uh, to have a just one as long as you know we have th the objectives that is not profit maximization or efficient maximization but an objective where uh, you know at the core is to uh, uh, to benefit or to protect the welfare of the people that such technology is supposed to help in the first place and it has to be also done by the people for them, for the people. So you can't build, you know, language technology from outside and, and, and uh, you know, uh, import it in, into these communities and, and call it uh, just technology. And yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, um, Abeba. So, um, you know, I, I, your, your point about these big data sets being inherently by default unjust and the only way we can kind of get the just outcomes from data sets is by them being located very much within you know, communities, within protocols that uh, communities have control over, that they've, you know, this this is um, kind of quite bleak in a certain sense in that, you know, and as you've just said, is how resource intensive it is. Yeah. Um, so I suppose, uh, Jenny, just perhaps turning to you, I mean, are, are there sort of, are there alternatives in terms of collective decision making or, um, community decision making that that could have some sort of more systemic effect, or is it actually only within you know community or collective that we're going to get these just outcomes, and we have to accept that the rest of the sort of systemic governance will, will by you know not not work in terms of producing just outcomes. Um, yeah. So so the way uh, um, the the way that I think about it is, is that I think we need to have. Uh, frameworks and policies and, and principles that essentially allow the kind of uh, and enable the the kind of federalism that Anita was talking about and the kind of responses that Abeba was just talking about, like the, with the with the Maori initiatives to be in charge of their of their own uh, of their own data. And there are um, uh, there are obviously uh, mechanisms through which you can have. Um, communities like that uh, gaining control of and and and, um, uh, and governing and, and and deciding outcomes for the kinds of data that that that, that we're talking about. The the things that one of the things that we're trying to do at, at Connected by Data is really make that practical. So um, I think that the the in the. Uh, the understanding that we need to have communities being practically in control of data that is about them and that is going to be used to affect them is something that seems to me to be 
uh, fairly common knowledge or common understanding across the data governance community. This is something that, you know, we're, we're talk a lot about collective data governance, participatory AI, um, the role of deliberative decision making and so on. The thing that is the is the challenge is to make that practical within the um, within the varying kinds of decisions that need to be made by organizations or by data holders or by communities. Um, and you need different kinds of techniques and different kinds of participatory techniques in order to make that happen. So for example, um, if you are setting big principles around the use of a particular type of data in a particular type of circumstance, then you need to have a big kind of deliberative participative exercise of the citizens jury or, or citizens assembly, something like that, that, um, that enables multiple voices, representative voices to be heard in a, in a considered way where you are um, you know, balancing up the different pros and cons and, and the, uh, the, the um, benefits and disbenefits that might come from different kinds of principles that you put around it. So really kind of considered approach in, uh, to set like these big principles. And then at the other kind of extreme, then you have um, very tiny kind of operational decisions that are being made by individual organizations about shall we share this data with this with this organization say for doing this particular research project where you also need to have some the voices of the people that are represented in the data and the voices of the people who are going to be affected by the use of the data in that research project in the discussion right so we need to have like different kinds and levels of, of participation, different forms of participation through all of the different kinds of decisions that are, are being made throughout a data life cycle and throughout the kind of uh, use of, of data um, uh, by different organizations and, and all of these ways. Um, now, getting there is going to is a is a big leap, but the only way that we do that is by getting the right policies and principles in place in the frameworks that we have and including at the international level right now then our frameworks are based on you know things that were that were agreed in the 1970s um, with a very kind of uh, global north uh, individualized kind of a, a approach to the way of using data and we really need to switch those to something that um like recognizes the collective impact of data that recognizes the right to participate in the way in which data is collected and used and shared and also has some teeth to it that that it that, that enables proper kind of voice and representation in the in the um it has some kind of redress mechanisms when that doesn't actually happen so getting those kinds of uh, frameworks in place that will then allow these varying different kinds of participation to actually happen, um, allow it, enforce it, and enable it. Um, those, that's what's going to be necessary in order to move us to that, that, uh, that better future that we, we need to be heading towards. Because right now we're on a path to a greater individualization of those kinds of decisions. Uh, you own your data, you control your data as, as being the way in which, um, uh, it, 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 as, as being the narrative that will that, that is um, uh, that is governing the way that organizations let you have control over your data and that individualization actually um, diminishes the power that we have collectively and in our communities in order to actually make a difference to the way in which data is uh, is used how we're represented in it and the way in which it, it has an impact on our on our lives um, so yeah, I, I hope I touched on the, the right kinds of things there, but there's multiple different types of forms of, of participation, but we need those high level frameworks and those policies in place in order to enable those things to actually happen. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, and I think uh, I'm sure that in Anita's responses to these questions are also going to bring up this issue of this individualization diminishing you know, the collective power that one might have if um, one gets these policy frameworks right. Just to um, go to um, Anita, Anita, your um, work on economic justice has been uh, drawn on our work at Research ICT Africa. We've, we've drawn very much on that. And of course, we um, work together um, for the Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence to 
um, draw out the work that you've been doing on economic justice, um, making the point that this is, you know, really uh, what is required that you actually need economic regulation if you're going to be trying to deal with some of the systemic and more structural inequities that are there, power inequities that are there. Would you speak to us a little bit more about that? Thanks, Alison. I, um, I think this is a very, very uh, interesting and somewhat contentious area. Why uh, would I say that? Because I wouldn't want to exoticize the idea of the collective. I think what we're not talking about is, you know, having a broad framework or a meta regulatory framework for data that works for the world in a business as usual way with a certain exceptionalism for people like, you know, the first peoples or Aboriginal peoples uh, like in my country. Um, but to actually look at this question of the collective as more like a social contract question, right? So what we're not talking about therefore is what do we do with uh, rules that can make every data set somewhat artisanal, right? That would be, I think, um, a, a distraction because yes, I think uh, stewardship practices of data should be a right because collectives, uh, you know, for instance, parents of children with a very rare disease could be part of a data community where they are pooling certain data and of course enabling people science to thrive uh, for instance. And, you know, that's a perfectly uh, uh, lawful activity. Uh, and I think it's the right of people to come together under a trust or under a society or whatever, which is a legal framework. But what we are talking about is how do you deal with public value creation while you recognize private value creation in the data economy. So the question of large versus artisanal, I think is probably a red herring. And what we need to do is really look at the social contract for data as something that's more like the idea that the municipalisms movement of Barcelona, Amsterdam and others have actually taught us, which is a bundle which will take care of the right to access and use which is the base in appropriability of the social commons of data, which means that it's neither yours nor mine. It is there because you and I are there together, right? What is a data point if not for its relationship with other data points, right? It, it's a meaningless empty signifier. So we're talking about the right to access and use, the right to share, the right to benefit from, right not to be harmed, right to be represented in the data or not, and the right to participate in the governance of data. And all of this, I think, are a bouquet of rights which should be articulated at the highest level in, in I think, at a global uh, inter intergovernmental multilateral uh, system as a set of rights, which then, of course, makes its way into contextual interpretations at national and subnational levels. The second point I want to make about the whole question of engineering this kind of economic rights and justice through a social contract for data would really be to also look not at ex post or post facto implications of transparency, auditability, right to explanation and algorithms and data. What we need is ex ante requirements, for instance, including uh, giving body to an idea of the right to explanation in data as a method of consultation, as the process through which registries will be, uh, you know, operational in how we decide to process data. You know, the latest uh, scam is how Uber drivers have been sent on untested routes just to collect data for the algorithm, just to check, you know, what may be the shortest route, you know, and this is something I just uh, read today. So, um, again, platform workers in India are not even aware of how uh, the companies actually experiment with, uh, you know, algorithmic trials uh, in various ways without their consent. So what we, of course, need and everybody agrees in this room is this kind of change in the business model of surveillance capitalism. And in this, I do see a strong role for uh, I would say unlikely alliances, you know, we need consumer movements to come together with worker movements. We need also to see that the idea of the internet community that stands for justice is a moving target, right? 
uh, you know, even three years ago in the UN IGF, no one thought platform workers were actually a stakeholder. Similarly, you know, today as we speak, you know, and in, in the era of smart agriculture, people, farmers are, are uh, important constituency. So I do think that this uh, bundle of rights needs to account for a futuristic scenario with very, very specific uh, abilities for uh, civic communities to mobilize around data left as an important right, but equally there should be, I think, an infrastructural dimension in the social contract to say in large scale data sets where we do need to address questions of, let's say, people's science in tuberculosis, in malaria, in, in you know, problems such as, for instance, in my country of child marriage, you know, sex selective abortions. What do we do? We do need large scale data sets, which is held by public agencies, you know, with independent scrutiny as you know within a model of custodianship right and the value from that the public value from that should be made available and that i think is the crucial question about the social contract of data thank you thank you very much for that anita um would anybody in the room like to make a comment or raise any questions keto can you give us any input from um there's a question online from helani Will you read that, or is she able to speak? She's she's going to speak. Hi, um, this is Helani Galpai from Learn Asia. So good to see this fabulous female panel. Uh, my question has in part been answered. I typed it out um, as Jenny was uh, making her last intervention, and I think it has in a way been beautifully been answered by Anita, but let me raise it anyway, because I'd really like to hear Jenny's point of view and anyone else's. Um, you know, we keep talking about community. What is a community? You know, I, I belong to multiple communities. Um, who decides who represents me, particularly in an unelected community representation kind of situation? And I belong to many communities that would not look after my rights. No, I'm not saying government looks after my rights, absolutely, but neither would some of the people who might represent my community. So how do we handle this idea of community? They're not democratically elected. Also, um, while I believe that communities defining sort of, you know, what data justice means and ownership of data, there's real value, not just in data, just in democratic governance. But at some point, you know, this is an infrastructure. Um, I need it to be provided by uh, an elected government or international, you know, treaty, etc. And I don't want to have to, you know, think every moment about this, you know, it's, it's like, you know, infrastructure is things that can't be self-provided. So don't we just, I mean, yes, communities need to participate, but we also just need international treaties and rules and, a, you know, set of, you know, governing principles, in a, you know, and, and what Anita is saying is, you know, you need the ex ante, not wait for the harm. So we really do need you know, governance rules and not necessarily expect communities all to take charge and sort of, you know, emerge from this, right? It has to be provided. That's why I have a government. That's why I pay taxes, etc. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Hilani. I think um, uh, Jenny can answer that right away. Um, I just wanted to say that there's another part of the uh, Global Partnership on Artificial Intelligence work on data trusts. Um, which was done by the APTI Institute and ODI, also has some very interesting conclusions of the burden of data trusts on communities um, and that they actually have to take on these additional responsibilities that are meant to be taken by the state. So, um, Jenny, I'm sure you've got a, a, a lot to say about that. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And hi, Helani. Nice to see you. Um, uh, yeah, so so I suppose a few things here. So f first of all, I tend to think about communities as being bounded by those that are affected by specific data collection and use. So rather than being a kind of ex ante community, it's, it's more that if you've got an algorithm that's predominantly affecting women, 
then you should include a diverse and representative set of women in the decision making around that algorithm. If you have a, uh, a collection of, of data that is um, about, say, factory workers, then you should be involving some diverse and representative set of factory workers in its in its collection and maintenance. And so the it, it's it's not that every community has to like set up a whole set of, of, of um, infrastructure in order to collect data about itself. It's more that if you are doing some data collection and stewarding of data, then please involve the members of the communities who are going to be affected in it, in, in the in, in the governance of it. Um, and of course, those data sets and that collection can happen at like a huge range of different kinds of levels, right? And, you know, I'm um, definitely on the same page as you when it comes to governments having a responsibility to provide data infrastructure at international scale, at national scale. But it's also useful for, say, local communities in, um, you know, particular uh, fishing villages to sometimes have stewardship of data for the data that is collected around that specific community so that they can benefit from it and so that they can have a say in how it is in how it is used. Um, and, you know, your point about unelected representatives not not representing me, this is a this is a challenge with any kind of democratic governance, right? Um, so, so, you know, everything that we learn from the basic participation literature and the basic participation kind of um, pieces that we've, uh, that has, has uh, and, and what good governance looks like in general for the last, I don't know, even hundreds of years, right? It's stuff that we need to apply ar around data. And we know that none of it is perfect. We know it's all, <laughs> you know, it, it is all broken. And what the way that we get to something that, that kind of works a bit better than uh, just technocratic decision makers is by having lots and lots of different kinds of checks and balances, lots of different actors in the system who are empowered and, and have different kinds of uh, different kinds of voices and are able to um, uh, able to through kind of um, uh, through through proper mechanisms through the rule of law be able to act on, on the way that 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 things work. So uh, I don't want to like paint paint the the picture as being you know we have all of these lovely communities who are just stewarding their their individual data sets. It's much more mixed picture than that. We've 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 got big infrastructural ones where the the stewardship is is, is governments or international organisations. We have very small ones that that are that are highly curated that are you know. Um, uh, very much representative of, of, of uh, a, a tiny set of, of governance, a, a, a tiny set of community people, and, and some loads and loads of mix in between, and different kinds of, in fact, even the, the governance themselves need to be different for those different kinds of communities, because you've got different norms and, and, and ways of operating in those different places, you know, we'll, we'll um, advocate for lovely cooperative data, uh, lovely cooperative types of structures, but there are other places where you, you need to have different kinds of governance because that's a different kind of, of norm and that's what's going to work. So I, I hope that kind of uh, addresses and answers some of that question. I noted that in your question, you also talked about what about my data, um, you know, making decisions on my behalf. I think we have to recognize the, the, um, the, the challenges of individuals making have about making decisions around their data and, and really, you know, the, the collective data governance mechanisms is something that should be empowering for individuals should provide them with the proper with choices that are not going to be coercive basically um uh, uh, so so that they do still have individuals do still have controls but they are ones that are meaningful rather than ones at the moment where it, it really isn't and, and your consent is often theater instead i hope that's helpful thank you so much for that jenny are there any questions in the room before I go to Abeba? Abeba, perhaps just because we, yes, Kito. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And then of course, uh, really, I'm happy uh, to see many uh, panelists uh, who are talking about data justice. Um, uh, from Ethiopia, uh, the of Science and Technology University, working in the area of data. 
uh, when it comes to especially uh, culturally and linguistically diversified nations like Ethiopia, uh, we have lots of challenges, you know, uh, to maintain the data justice, the, the, the fairness, you know, ethical, uh, machine learning system, AI systems. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the issue of data justice is related to uh, who owns the data, who produces the data, you know. Uh, lots of challenges. Building the data set is the main area where we need to be more balanced, more equitable, responsible. Machine learning systems could be produced, and then, of course, we can use those data in a fair way for, for all communities, you know, in such a way that nobody is going to be affected negatively. Uh, the challenge is, you know, uh, the producers or the data we have uh, from different sources are being owned by either by the government or the big companies, social medias. And then the people, the communities have no, no uh, mechanism to control them. And then, then of course, how those uh, data sets are being used what kind of learning system, decision systems are being produced, and then those are the challenges. The other thing, of course, sometimes the privacy of uh, users are being abused, especially marginalized communities, uh, women, disabled peoples. And then we want to bring some kind of fairness you know, uh, in, the, in the data ecosystem. And then the issue is, you know, uh, there must be a mechanism how we can we can control how the data is being uh, produced, and then of course the data sets are being prepared, and then what systems are in validation, testing, and then of course making those uh, government as well as uh, AI systems, which are of course used for decision making, being being more responsible, ethical. These are the major issues I'm having. Especially, I don't know the actual, but Mr. Bebe was raising about the language technology, for example. We have lots of issues, diversified 80 languages in Ethiopia. Uh, some of the languages have enough resources, others do not have. And then bringing all these data is serving all communities is equitable, and then, of course, fair manner is a challenge. Uh, the infrastructures are there. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I know this is a, such a big issue and we haven't had much chance to speak, but we are probably going to lose our online people when they sharply cut us off at, um, at, at quarter two. So um, I'm going to quickly ask Abeba to take that question and perhaps, Abeba, just to respond to some of the points that were made previously by Jenny and, 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 um, and by Anita, practically, um, <laughs> from your practical experience, can we do that? Can we do some of those things? Uh, yes, uh, great points uh, we, uh, with the gentleman there. I, I agree. Uh, and uh, I guess, like, can we do that? It, it depends. Are we in a position of power? Those that are in a position of power really make the decisions, especially for people in this room. It's clear that, you know, people at the margins of society tend to be uh, to to uh, uh, to be impacted much more disproportionately, whether it is through large-scale data set collection or model building, but uh, these groups and these communities often are disfranchised and they they just don't have power. Take this very panel, for example. Uh, it was scheduled to take place on Wednesday, but other big organizations that have more funding, more money. I won't name names. Uh, managed to swap the timing, so we ended up at the at the last minute, at the last time on 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 this slot, while they presented uh, their uh, their uh, their presentations on Wednesday. They they took our spot. So uh, where the money is, the power is, <laughs> and it's ironic because this is a panel on data justice. And uh, yeah, uh, so what I want to say is. Uh, uh, as it, the world as it is tends to uh, uh, to move from the, the most powerful to the, uh, well, the, the most powerful tend to, to make the decisions. Whether there has, I myself have done the research, especially around machine learning and AI, uh, people with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, big corporations, uh, people coming from elite universities, 
uh, are centralizing huge amounts of research and empower when it, com when it comes to data and AI systems. Uh, so uh, I guess the, my final point would be when we are talking about can these, uh, uh, can these points be, can, is it possible, can they be realized, uh, then I would answer that question with another question. Uh, can we move uh, power from the most to the least powerful? That way, then, uh, then we open up the, the forum, we open up the, the door for these issues to be, to be realized. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Alison. Sorry, <laughs> the online um, people couldn't hear you. I'm surprised they haven't been cut off, um, but we we are being um, pushed out of the room. <laughs> the next session panel is starting. I was just saying that um, despite. Um, Abeba's observations that we'd been shifted out to the graveyard slot of the conference. The panel was so exciting that um, I think we've had a lovely attendance and we'll continue those conversations um, of offline. And just, I was thanking very much the RIA team that's put this together. So thank you all, take care and travel safely, bye. <laughs>